from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of all my colleagues, and in particular, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, Chief of the African and Middle East Division, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone. I'm Joan Weeks, head of the Near East section, and the sponsor of today's program. We were very pleased to present this program to you on Islamic architecture and its relevance to daily human needs. Uh, but before we start today's program, I'd like to give you just a brief overview of our reading room and our uh, division. This is a custodial division, and it's comprised of three sections that build and serve our collections to researchers from around the world. We cover over 78 countries and more than two dozen languages. The Africa section includes all of the countries of South Sahara Africa. The Hebraic section covers all of Hebraic worldwide, and the Near East section covers all of the Arabic countries, including North Africa, Turkey, Turkic Central Asia, Iran, Afghanistan, and the Muslims of Western China, Russia, and the Balkans, and the people of the Caucasus. So you can see how extensive our coverage is. After the program, uh, we'd like to invite you to fill in the little evaluation forms we've left in your chairs. Uh, this gives us an opportunity to see how you like the program and evaluate them. Also, we left little flyers in your seats about our Four Corners blog. And if you sign up for the blog and our Facebook page, you get to hear about our future programs and also see some very interesting posts by our curators. Uh, we would also uh, let you know that this program is being videotaped so that if you ask a question at the end, you're implicitly giving our permission to be videotaped. And uh, after the program, we have a lovely surprise. Uh, we'd like to invite you to a reception in our Northeast Pavilion behind here. And we want to thank the Egyptian Embassy for providing all the wonderful food and drink. So now I'd like to call upon my colleague, Dr. Fauzi Tadros, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Heba Abdin Nabi received her PhD from the University of Alexandria, Egypt in 2004. She received the Fulbright Foundation Scholarship to conduct research and to teach at Mary Baldwin College, Virginia, in 2007 and 2008. There, she taught Islamic art and architecture. Currently, she is teaching Islamic architecture at the University of Alexandria, Egypt. Dr. Abdel Nabi has published a number of research papers in numerous national and international journals. She has published a number of books on topics related to art, architecture, and social life during the Islamic era. She held a number of administrative positions in executive manager of Quality Assurance Unit, and she is currently vice dean for graduate student and research at the faculty of Alexandria. Dr. Abdel Nabi will be speaking today on the various structures in Islamic architecture, including religious, military, residential, and commercial. Dr. Abdel Nabi is a member of the Islamic art historian uh, of the United Kingdom, the Middle East Association, and the Arab Historian Association. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Abdel Nabi. Uh, 
Um, I'm really honored to be invited today to, uh, by the Congress Library uh, together, uh, I mean the African and Middle Eastern Division in collaboration with the Egyptian Cultural and the Egyptian Bureau to give a lecture about Islamic architecture. So uh, I'm very thankful to Dr. Uh, Fauzi Tadrus, Dr. Mary, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Hamza, and Dr. Magid Said. Uh, today, um, the lecture will be Today, the lecture will be about Islamic architecture. Actually, it will uh, be like an overview about Islamic architecture uh, from the 7th till the 18th century. And uh, the, aim, the aim of the lecture is to give, a, uh, is to answer two main questions. The first question is, were the buildings designed to meet the daily life needs of the people, the Islamic uh, architectural buildings? Were the buildings also designed to meet the needs of the environment? Those are the two main questions I intend to answer or to try to answer today during this lecture. I thought it would be helpful, helpful to start with the chronology of Egypt, uh, the chronology of the Islamic era in general. First, to show you where we can see Islamic architecture. And um, so we can see Islamic architecture in various countries in the Middle East and in, the, um, in Asia too. Uh, like India and China and Pakistan. Uh, but uh, actually, I will be focusing on Egypt in particular, because most of the examples I will be presenting are about uh, monuments or buildings, Islamic or architectural buildings from Egypt. So I thought it would be um, useful to start with uh, telling you the chronology of uh, the, the Islamic era in Egypt, which uh, was, um, Egypt was, you can't hear me? Uh, Egypt uh, was opened by the Arabs, by the Muslims, uh, during uh, the rightly guided caliphs era, and then it was ruled by the Umayyads and then the Abbasids, and uh, during that era it was ruled by the Tulunid era, or the Tulunid dynasty, and then it was followed by the Fatimid era, the, uh, the Ayyubid, uh, the Mamluk, and the Ottoman. So I will be presenting um, um, examples from those various eras, and um, um, each uh, image which with, uh, that will be presented uh, has a caption indicating the name of the place and uh, the era it dates to and the, the, the uh, place of building, of course. To start with, I should mention that Islamic architecture has many types of buildings, and those buildings could be classified into four main groups, religious buildings, residential buildings, military buildings, and service buildings. And the service buildings, as we will discuss later, could include two types of services, free services and paid services. That's why we included the commercial buildings in that category too. To start with the religious buildings, I will start with the mosque, which is the most important building in Islamic architecture. The earliest mosque in Islamic architecture was the mosque of the Prophet Muhammad at al Madina. But of course, I, I can't present an image of the mosque of the Prophet Muhammad at al Madina now because uh, it does not represent at all the original shape of the mosque. It, it uh, was uh, pulled down, rebuilt, renovated, uh, uh, enlarged several times through ages. So there is a drawing about the mosque of the Prophet Muhammad. It shows how simple the building was. It was like a rectangular area surrounded with a wall built of mud brick, and it had in its northern, uh, sorry, in its southern part, uh, a roofed area which was called Sofa. This roofed area consisted of palm trucks covered with uh, palm branches. Uh, this is the area which was devoted for the Muslims to pray in. And when the number of the Muslims increased, they added another roofed area in the northern part, so they had two places for prayer. The rest of the mosque was like an open space. 
Actually, this mosque was the nucleus of the Muslim community at that time. It was not only a religious place where you can perform the, the five daily prayers or where you, where you can perform the Friday prayer. It was also um, the administrative center of the newly established Muslim community. So uh, th there you can see the Prophet Muhammad uh, uh, dealing with the daily uh, issues of the Muslim community. It was also a social place, uh, a place for social gatherings. They can hold weddings, uh, social meetings, and so on in the mosque. It was also um, even used during uh, times of war. They could have like a tent in which they can heal the wounded uh, warriors inside the mosque. So it, fu it fulfilled many functions at that time. And uh, during the reign of the rightly guided caliphs, similar simple mosques were established in each of the Islamic capitals. And they were very much similar to the mosque of the Prophet Muhammad. And of course, they functioned exactly as the mosque of the Prophet Muhammad. By the increase in number of the Muslim community, that simple building was no longer sufficient for the Muslim community. Uh, so by, by the beginning of the um, um, Umayyad era, the Umayyad had a different plan. The Umayyad caliphs had a very promising building program. They wanted to have large mosques which can be representing the newly established Muslim empire and they can compete with the older uh, buildings of the old uh, with the other buildings of the older civilizations so they started to establish huge mosques this is an example of those early mosques which is the great mosque of the mosques um, you can notice how huge the mosque is it is different from the drawing of the mosque of the prophet muhammad it was paved with marble it was richly decorated as you can notice so it is a diff it is very much different from the very simple mosques in the beginning. And um, um, for them, it was like the media which will be presenting the Islamic empire at that time or the Umayyad dynasty at that time. At that time, the plan of the mosque was very well established. They decided that the traditional plan or the, the, that plan or what we need in the plan of the mosque is to be consisting of an open court if I use the mouse, yes, that's better. Uh, it consists of an open court surrounded with four roofed areas. The, uh, only the roofed areas were used for prayer, okay? But the open court is not used for prayer. So this is the, uh, the plan that we will see almost everywhere in the um, Islamic uh, countries and almost in all the eras. This is, for example, the mosque of Ahmad ibn Tulun, which is uh, the main mosque which was built in the Tulunid capital in Egypt, al qataa during the Abbasid era. We should understand how it functioned or how the mosque was used. Um, for, uh, for the Muslims, they have to, to perform the Friday prayer. And according to the religion at that time, they had like strict rules saying that the Friday prayer should be held in only one mosque in each city. So according to that, that mosque should be, number one, should be huge in order to inhabit all the Muslim community or populace. Number two, it should, be, it should be placed or should be located in the center of the capital so it could be accessible from all quarters of the city. Number three, it should have many doors in order to avoid crowdedness and to avoid um, um, or, and to be accessible for as many people as possible who will be praying inside the mosque. All that we can see here in the mosque of Ahmad ibn Tulun and all the mosques that they were built uh, at the same time. Uh, you can notice how huge this mosque uh, was. It is more, more than uh, uh, 6,000 uh, square meters and it has 21 doors in all the three uh, sides uh, except for the Qibla side. 
And um, even when they no notice that it is not large enough to inhabit the all uh, to inhabit all the Muslim community, they added an exterior wall, which added an extra place, which was known as Ziyada or the addition. We will see that here in the plan. So we see that the plan of the mosque became like the open court, the roofed areas, which we called at that time rewaks. Those are the places where the Muslims can pray. And this, these are, those openings are the doors. And this is the exterior wall which was even added to add an extra place for prayer, which is the ziyada or the addition. Okay? We notice also that inside each one of the four rewards, there are rows of columns. Those rectangular um, uh, things are the columns which were built inside the mosque, and uh, they carry the arches in order to carry the roof. This is the first function, and it also facilitates organizing the Muslims into rows when they pray. What else do we need inside the mosque? What should be inside the mosque? The first thing that should be inside the mosque is the prayer niche or the qibla direction, the, uh, a place to indicate the qibla direction. According to uh, the Islamic religion, all Muslims has to face Mecca in prayer. And of course, the uh, direction of qibla or the direction of prayer would vary from country to another according to its location in relation to Mecca. For example, in Egypt, the qibla direction is towards southeast. In Iraq, it is towards southwest. In the United States, for example, it would be towards east or southeast. Okay, so it varies from place to another according to its location in relation to Mecca. So each mosque has to have uh, an indicator of the Qibla in order to help the people who will pray to know where to stand and what to face. Okay, the Qibla direction was in the beginning a f uh, just a mark on the wall which was simple, simple and flat. But later, the Muslims started to make the prayer niche in that form, which is a concave prayer niche. Why concave? Because the Imam would be facing the prayer niche and the concave shape of the prayer niche would resonate the sound of the Imam. Another thing which is very important inside the mosque, or specifically inside the jama. The jama is the congregational mosque where the Friday prayer is held. So it is the large one that we mentioned before. The jama should have a member or pulpit. The pulpit is the place where the imam can uh, preach the uh, worshipers before starting the prayer. And it is an essential part of the Friday prayer. So they added another uh, furniture, or we can call it uh, uh, an, another element inside the mosque, which is the pulpit. The pulpit, as you can notice, is a raised place or a raised seat for the imam. A raised seat for the imam, ascended by a flight of steps. And on top of that place, there is a dome, also to resonate the sound. Not that only, but they even added another huge dome above the area of the prayer niche and the pulpit together, above the square which occupies the prayer niche and the pulpit, because the pulpit is usually to the right of the prayer niche. So they added a dome above that square in order to resonate and magnify the sound. But still, could you imagine in a mosque as the mosque of Ahmad ibn Tulun, which I showed you, uh, I show you uh, the picture of, uh, do you imagine that the people who are praying in the back rewalk at the end of the mosque would listen to the imam, would hear the imam? Probably not, because it is very huge. So they probably will not hear the imam. That's why they added another element inside the mosque, which was called Dikkit al-Muballigh. Dikkit al-Muballigh is a platform 
either made of wood or made of marble, carried on uh, a group of columns and ascended by a flight of steps. And on top of that place, there, there used to be a man who was called al muballigh who repeats whatever the imam is saying. Here is the, uh, the prayer niche, and next to it is the pulpit. So the imam would be standing here, and the man uh, or the muballigh uh, on top of the dikkah would be seeing the imam and would repeat whatever the imam was saying. So the people at the back of the mosque would hear him or at least see him. How they would see him? This dikkah was located at the end of the qibla riwaq overlooking the open court. So they would see him through the open court. What else do we need inside the mosque? We also need a fountain, which was usually located in the center of the open court in order to perform ablution and uh, to provide drinking water during summertime, uh, which are very hot, of course, in the Middle East. We also need the minaret. The minaret is a very high tower, which was built on top of the building, on top of the mosque, on, uh, on its ceiling. And uh, it was used by the muazzin, who was responsible to call for the prayer. And by that mean, uh, all the people from all quarters of the city would hear the call of prayer and come to the mosque for prayer. Now we come to the second building in a religious, or the second type of religious buildings, which is the madrasa. I mentioned that the mosque was functioning as the nucleus of the Muslim community, and actually it, ful it fulfilled all the needs of the newly established community. Um, elementary education was even held inside the mosque. You would see things like that. Um, the sheikh or the imam would be sitting next to one of the pillars and the students would be gathering around him in a circle. That's why they called that system of education the halaqa education. Or, halaqa is the equivalent word to circle in Arabic. Okay, so they call it the halaqa education. So those could be uh, young children and could be also adults who are listening to uh, a highly educated sheikh or imam. Uh, this system of education was called halaqa, was called also riwaq, referring to the place where the education was held or the teaching was held. It was also called, uh, it was also called um, zawiya because they could like take a corner of the um, riwaq in order to have their listen. Some of the mosques actually only the large mosques had um, um, similar halaqa, but for adults. And that was like a, a, a sort of informal uh, higher education or informal type of higher education. It was free of charge, but yet it was depending on the sheikh or the imam. Uh, it depends on his time, his availability. So it was not uh, um, uh, established as a formal system of education. By the 10th century, the Muslims realized that they need a formal system of education for higher education in particular. That's when they separated the education from the, uh, from the mosque, or they took the education outside of the mosque. They started what we call the madrasa. The Seljuks, or the Seljuk sultans, are those who started the building of the madrasa. The earliest madrasa was built in Baghdad, which was called Al Mustansuriya Madrasa. And after that, the Ayyubids followed the same traditions of the Seljuks, and they brought the idea of building the madrasas into Egypt. So they started, the madrasa started during the Ayyubid era. Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi uh, was alone responsible for building 10 madrasas in his reign, and his successors followed him in the same tradition, and it became a very um, uh, popular building during the Mamluk period in, part in particular. The plan of the madrasa was different from the plan of the mosque in order to fulfill the function of the madrasa, which is different from the function of the mosque. What was the function of the madrasa? The madrasa 
uh, according to the cell jokes, was intend intended to provide formal, uh, formal system of higher education, and it was also intended to, um, to be um, a way to stop the Shia spread in the Muslim countries. So the Seljuks intended to teach the Sunni laws inside the madrasa. And in the Sunni law, we have four schools of thought, which are the Shafi'i, Hanfi, Hanbali, and Malki. That's why when they started erecting the madrasas, most of them were following that plan, which we call the cruciform plan, which consists of an open court surrounded with four iwans. It's not rewar this time. Those are called iwans. What is the iwan? The iwan is like a huge room, room uh, overlooking the open court, and it opens to the open court, uh, as you can see. So it could be like a classroom for uh, a group of students. By the way, this is the largest iwan in Islamic architecture in Cairo, which is the qibla iwan of the madrasa of Sultan Hassan. This was visited by Barack Obama, by the way. Um, it was intended to be the largest in Islamic architecture in order to compete with uh, Kisra Iwan, which had the repetition of being the largest Iwan in architecture. Um, the madrasa was functioning as a boarding school, so both the teachers and the students lived inside the madrasa. Um, in order to uh, uh, accommodate with that, the madrasa should have residential rooms for both the teachers and the students. The madrasa should also have a kitchen, uh, bathrooms, uh, stables for the, the donkeys or the, the animals of the uh, teachers and the students. Okay? Uh, sometimes even in large madrasas, they had a small hospital in order to serve the students and the teacher living inside the madrasa. So it, it has all the services they might need. Um, actually, the even I should mention one thing also. It was uh, free. It was uh, a, a system of education that is free of charge. Moreover, it was funded by the patron. By the way, the patron or the, the person who uh, built the madrasa, they were usually sultans, emirs, high officials, wealthy merchants or uh, uh, judges, uh, things like that, who will be um, um, who would have the initiation to build a madrasa, and they fund everything. They set the rule for choosing the students. They set the administrative regulations inside the madrasa. Uh, they set the, uh, the, how the fund wa will be distributed inside the madrasa. And both the teachers and the students will get stipends uh, for uh, being in the madrasa. They would receive three daily meals, three hot meals per day. Uh, they would receive clothes uh, in the beginning of summertime and in the beginning of winter time. Um, all that was more like incentives for people to, uh, to, to learn at that time. And it was very successful, especially in the Mamluk period. How about elementary education? This was the form of education for uh, um, adults. How about elementary education? Elementary education was separated from the mosque at the same time uh, as the madrasa, and it functioned inside another institution which was called al kutab the uh, Kutab. Um, it could be private kutab, it could be government-funded kutab, and it was like a very uh, simple room where students gather to uh, learn Quran, the reading and recitation of and memorization, of course, of Quran, uh, in addition to uh, basics of grammar and uh, basics of math. Um, this is the kutab from outside, one of the katati from outside, and uh, um, the other kutab from inside. And by the way, uh, my master's degree was about the katati in the Mamluk era in Egypt. Um, of course, you notice that the education was more like religious education, okay? Uh, either in the kutab or in the madrasa. But some of the large madrasas also provided classes for chemistry, um, physics, uh, medicine, but those were um, uh, limited and according to the will of the patron, as I mentioned. 
Another religious building is the monastic mosque or the Khanqa. The Khanqa is uh, or was built uh, in response to Sufism, which started to be witnessed in uh, the fourth century of Islam or the 10th century. Again, the building of the Khanqa was created or started by the Seljuks, and uh, from them, the Ayyubids uh, uh, took the idea and presented into Egypt. Sufism is... Um, some way or another close to monasticism. It is uh, a way of thinking where you abandon life and uh, just uh, devote your life for worship. So the people who are living inside the Khanqa are not working, so they should have been funded by the government. This is a place where they can live and they can receive their education, and at the same time they are self-sufficient. So they would do all the required work inside the Khanqa without needing any, anything else from outside. The Khanqa was following either the plan of the madrasa or the plan of the mosque. But the most essential part inside the Khanqa was the khalawat. The khalawat are the small rooms where the uh, Sufis can um, um, alienate themselves in order to worship. So they were very small rooms. And it was also just like the madrasa in terms of regulations and the uh, functioning system. So they also have their own kitchen, bathroom, uh, everything they might need of services. Another religious building is the mausoleum, or the burial place. In Arabic, we call it matfan, or turba. Okay? In the beginning of Islam, the mausoleum was a separate place, which was usually outside of the city. But by the end of the Ayyubid era, they started to attach the mausoleum to a religious building, either a madrasa or a khanqa. What is the reason behind that? Number one, to commemorate the name of the deceased person in, in the city between the people, so he could be remembered by the, by the people, not in a remote place outside of the city. That's number one. And number two, to benefit from the prayers of the people who are benefiting from the free services offered to those who are using the building. As I mentioned, the madrasa was free, so all the services are provided by the patron. So the people would, or the students would be always praying for the patron who provided them all, all those free services. So in Egypt, it would be a very uh, regular scene to see uh, each mosque attached with a mausoleum like this one. And uh, this huge building only contains the burial place of the founder. Um, they used the place for reciting the Quran 24-7 all day long, and the uh, people passing by the place would be listening to the Quran being recited all the time, and of course that also brings blessing to the deceased person. Those are um, uh, normal scenes uh, from Islamic architecture that we can see in Egypt. Each mosque, each madrasa attached with a mausoleum, especially in the uh, Mamluk period. Now we come to the second type of Islamic architecture building, which is military buildings. Military buildings were witnessed in Egypt as early as the Fatimid era. Only the Fatimids felt that they need military architecture. Why? They built the fourth uh, Islamic capital in Egypt, which is Al-Qahira, after Al-Fustat, Al-Askar, Al and Al-Qata'a. So this was the fourth capital. And this capital was the residence of the caliph, the high officials, and the army. So they felt it should be protected. They surrounded the city. As a result, they surrounded the city with walls built of uh, mud brick in the beginning and then renovated to be built of stone. And those walls were penetrated with eight doors that were closed at night in order to protect the people inhabiting the city. Those walls uh, and gates were like fortified gates, so they would look like castle or they would look like towers like that. And they were named with the uh, names that could bring good luck or good fortune. For example, this is the gate of victory, Bab al Nasr. And this is Bab al Fituh, or gate of opening. So all are names to bring good luck. Of course, for the Sultan or the Caliph. 
um, during the reign of, during the Ayyubid era, it was, that particular era was the, um, the epic or uh, the apex of uh, building military architecture. Because, bec of course, because the, the struggle against the Crusades at that time. So Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi uh, built the castle of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, which was built on top of the Muqattab Hill in the center of this, the capital. And um, this citadel was actually divided into two parts, the northern enclosure wall, the northern enclosure wall, which was built during the era of Salah al-Din himself, and it was totally military in spirit and in function. But then after the death of Salah al-Din, some of his successors, like the, uh, like the Sultan al-Kamil, uh, decided to have the citadel as the seat of rulership, the, the place where he can rule the country from. So they added the southern enclosure wall, and they added palaces, administrative centers, uh, uh, gardens and uh, whatever they might need and it became or it continued to be used as the seat of the governor of Egypt since the uh, uh, reign of El Kamil till the building of uh, Abdim Palace in the modern time in Egypt. Now we come to the third type of buildings which are the residential buildings. There were three types of buildings, of course, according to the economic status of people. The, on top of those were the palaces. Only the elite and the wealthy people of the uh, country would, be, would afford to live in a palace. And then the house. Also, also wealthy people can afford to live in a house, but the house can inhibit a huge family, uh, up to 400 persons in some cases. Uh, and for the common people or the middle class, they would live in a place called Raba. Raba is like um, uh, a large building with rooms that could be rented, and in each floor there is a bathroom, and uh, all the people renting in that floor would be sharing the bathroom together. Okay, this is the uh, residential uh, building, or this is the residential accommodation for the military class. The house was um, um, very much similar to the palace, but it was smaller in size. So all the components of the house were similar to the components of the palace. What are those components in relation to the needs of the people? we should have an open court. I think you've noticed that the open court is very essential in Islamic architecture. It is the nucleus of each building. Most of the buildings have uh, um, the open court, and we will see later why it is important. Um, so uh, the, the center of the building or the house would be the open court, and all the parts of the house would be surrounding that open court. We need a reception hall for the guests. That's what we need inside, in that, inside the house. We need a reception hall for the guests. We need a sitting place for the people, the, the, the house owner and his family, okay? So this would be called maqad. Maqad is the sitting place in Arabic, uh, and it is overlooking the open court, so the, the, the owner of the house or the family or the parents would be uh, supervising the children who might be playing in the uh, open court. In addition to many other rooms used as bedrooms, and they were very simple in terms of decoration, except for the ceiling, which was usually wooden ceiling, richly decorated with floral and uh, floral decorations and inscriptions. Uh, of course, we, we need uh, a kitchen inside the house. We also need bathroom inside the house. Those are the components of the residential building. Now we come to the fourth type of buildings, which, which is the service buildings and the commercial buildings too. Here we will, we will be differentiating between two types of buildings. Buildings provided, providing uh, free service and other buildings which are providing paid services. Let's start with the bathroom. Uh, 
As I mentioned, only the wealthy people can afford to live in a palace or in a house, and only those who have their own bathroom. But the common people or the middle class w would be sharing a bathroom with others. So having a public bathroom was very important at that time, and uh, those public bathrooms were used for all people, even the wealthy ones. They would use the public bathroom, um, and uh, they go to the bathroom at least once a week, and there they can have bathing, massage, uh, cleaning, all the services that you can imagine in the bathroom. And by the way, you can still see the bathroom functioning in some of the Islamic countries, such as in Turkey and in Morocco. They are still existing and they are still functioning, actually. The bathroom would be divided into three main sections. The first section, which is called the cold room, uh, where you can take off your clothes and take like a, um, a shower with the cold water. And then the second room where you can have, where you can find places for massaging. And then the third room where you can have, uh, or you, you can find a bathtub with very hot water and you can have your uh, bathing there. Another, of course, this is not a free service. <laughs> that was a paid service. Um, the, another service which is uh, free this time, it's the Sabil. The Sabil is a place that provides water free of charge to any passerby. This was very essential in hot countries like in Egypt, for example. Uh, imagine uh, the, the temperature during summertime and uh, going from place to another uh, in the hot days, of course you would need a drink. So that place would provide you a, a, a cup with cold water um, uh, free of charge. What is the Sabil? It's a very simple building. It consists of just one room, and uh, this is the room uh, above the ground level, but there is a cistern behind, uh, sorry, below it, which is under the ground, and the cistern was filled with water, or they can provide they, their needs or their daily needs uh, by al saqqa or the one who carries water and brings to the Sabil. Inside the Sabil, a man used to work who was known as Mizamilati. His function was, or his duty was, to clean the Sabil and um, 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 fill the basin in front of each uh, of the windows. Of course, the Sabil should have as many windows as possible in order to help so many people. So in front of each window, there would be a basin. Uh, uh, the duty of the Mizamilati is to fill that basin with water and to hand water in cups through the window to the people. That's the basin, okay? Another service which was offered at that time and the architecture was responding to that need of the society was the wikela. This is another service. It is like a hotel, but for merchants in particular. Uh, the wikela uh, could be seen inside the city. Again, it consists of an open court and it has storage rooms in the lower level or the ground level where merchants can save their merchandise. And then in the upper levels, there are uh, rented rooms that could be used by those travelers or those merchants. Similar to this building was the Khan, but the Khan was built outside of the city on the travel roads. But it has the same plan. And also similar to that is the market. But instead of renting uh, a room, they would rent a shop instead. So that's the market from inside. Then we come to the last uh, service building, which is the hospital or the Bimaristan. It is actually a unique building because it offered free medical service. 
um, and they ca they are open or the place is open to everyone, regardless their nationality, their economic status, their uh, um, social status, their religion, their sex. It was open to all the people and it provided everything. It provided them food, it provided them uh, the medicine. Even if a poor uh, patient died inside the hospital, they would take care of his burial and uh, do all the necessary things to be done. The Bimaristan was following the same plan of the madrasa, which is an open court surrounded by four EUNs, in order to facilitate the segregation of patients according to the disease. I think by now we can come to a conclusion that those buildings, each and every one of those building, buildings was fulfilling a need for the society or fulfilling a need for the people. But how about understanding the needs of the environment? Was that also witnessed in Islamic architecture or not? Let's see. We noticed that the open uh, in the mosque, for example, let's start by the mosque, Let's start by the mosque. Uh, we should have an open court in addition to the roofed areas. And the open court was very necessary in order to provide lighting and ventilation for the other roofed area areas. Um, moreover, the roofed areas usually have high ceiling for the same reason, for providing lighting and ventilation. Water was very essential also inside the mosque in order to provide drinking water and to moisture the air inside the place. In the madrasa, the same applies. Water was very essential inside the madrasa. So each madrasa would have either a well, a water wheel, or a sabil inside the madrasa. They had their own standards for the rooms of the teachers and the students. Each room should have at least one window, either overlooking the open court or overlooking the street like this case, okay, in order to be very well ventilated. Um, as for the kitchen, bathrooms, and stables, they should be located on the south of the madrasa. Why on the southern side of the madrasa? Because most of the wind in Egypt is north or northeastern wind, so the wind would take the bad smells away from the madrasa, not into the madrasa. As for the kutab, which inhabited a large number of children all the time, it should be an open place with so many openings, but at the same time, its ceiling would be uh, protecting the children from the sun um, uh, during their study. Um, another unique thing is the, the standards they followed inside the mosque, uh, sorry, inside the house. The entrance of the house, for example, should be a bent entrance which means that if you are standing in front of the entrance of the house, you wouldn't be able to see anything from the interior. You wouldn't be able to see uh, the people inside the house. Why? To provide uh, the privacy for the people and at the same time to protect the interior of the house from the dust in the street. And of course, having the open court would be essential to provide lighting and ventilation to all the parts of the, music, uh, of the house. Okay. I'll have just two minutes. <laughs> um, another thing which is very unique also in the house was the use of mashrabeya. The mashrabeya is to cover the windows and it is made of turned wood. So it is like pierced wood that can purify the, the air which is coming into the room and at the same time providing privacy for the women behind the windows so no one can see them. The use of high ceilings also to provide cooling for the reception hall, which is the hall for guests. The use of marble. Some of the reception halls had a fountain in them, and uh, the fountain, of course, was made of marble and uh, was um, um, having uh, uh, running water in summertime, also to provide moisturing for the air in summertime. 
the open loggia or the open place, the sitting place for the family. It was always built in the east, in the northern side of the house in order to be facing the north or northeastern wind, as we mentioned, which was the common wind in Egypt. Of course, also to be the perfect location for sitting during summer nights and days. The Sabil, they also had their own standards for the health and uh, for the health of the Mizamilati who works inside the Sabil. They had very strict regulations in terms of the cleanliness of the cistern, the cups, the basin, and how they, they provide the water for the people. So uh, all of that to keep the um, healthy condition of the place. They even have... Um, um, a unique thing, which is a small basin behind, uh, b below each one of the windows. So if you have uh, uh, some remaining water in your cup, you wouldn't throw them or get rid of them. You would pour them in uh, the basin, which would be used for drinking of animals. The same uh, regulations that applied in the house would be applied also in the wikala and the uh, khan, which were like residential places, but for merchants or travelers. And last but, lot, but not least is the hospital. Um, as I mentioned, the segregation was very important to reduce infection. So they would segregate between the patients according to the disease they have. And also they have very strict regulations in terms of pre preparing and preserving food, drinks, and medicine in order to avoid contamination of food and medicine and of course to reduce the uh, infection. So actually, we can conclude that they understood very well the needs of the environment. They understood very well the needs of the society, the daily life needs of the people. And um, um, one of the architects in Egypt known as Hassan Fathi actually inspired a, or was inspired by Islamic, by Islamic architecture to create modern houses and modern places who would be um, functioning in, in today and fulfilling the needs of the people exactly as the Islamic architecture fulfilled the needs of the people. I hope I didn't take too much time and thank you very much for listening. Any questions? Any questions, please? I think it was easier for them to build in rectangular or square buildings. It was easier to handle the available st space inside. But this is in terms of the building. As for the city, the normal thing for cities in Islamic architecture was to build uh, round-shaped uh, cities. So the city would be circular, while the buildings would be either rectangular or uh, square. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes. Yes, sure. Um, as for prayers, during the time of the rightly guided caliphs, women used to pray behind men, but they were not separated from the men, so just behind them. Um, by the, after that, during the uh, Umayyad era, uh, we have no record that, also, that they were also separated from men. So probably they would have been praying behind the men. And uh, it happened like that all the time, probably till the Ottoman time, when we started to see a sort of separation 
by providing a specific place for women to pray in, uh, 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 separated from the place for men. This is for prayer. As for education, we have uh, um, um, records of historians telling us that uh, families were sending their uh, children, or, I mean female children, the girls, they would send them to private katatib to receive education. Okay, so children, I mean, the, the girls were also taught, but probably they were taught only the elementary education. So they receive only the elementary education. And uh, of course, those are the wealthy family only, but the common people who are in the middle class, it would be hard for them to send their girls for, um, uh, to receive education in the Kotab. But during the Mamluk period, um, I told you that my thesis was uh, about the Katatib in the Mamluk period. Um, um, I realized that uh, during the Mamluk period, there were some Katatibs for uh, uh, girls only and some other Katatibs for uh, boys. And uh, some of the uh, elite of the society would uh, continue to send their girls to a specific sheikh or uh, uh, teacher in in order to uh, um, give them higher education. So we have records about women who were reciting the Quran or telling the Hadith after the Prophet Muhammad or uh, famous women who were historians. So that appeared but only in medieval times, at least if in Egypt, which I can uh, tell about. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> My question now about uh, this government. Are they deserved by the government? Are they protected? Are they who like the government? Yes, sure. They are preserved. Actually, the Ministry of Tourism, together with the Ministry of uh, um, uh, Archaeology, are paying or uh, doing so much effort to preserve those buildings, especially in Cairo. We have more than 500 Islamic buildings in Cairo. Uh, you know that Cairo was known as the city of southern minarets because it used to have more than 1,000 buildings of Islamic architecture, but their number is uh, the number was reduced. Uh, uh, but they are um, doing so much effort to preserve those buildings and they paying so much uh, to maintain them and some of them are offering uh, uh, guiding tours or guided tours also uh, but the problem about islamic architecture is that it is uh, mingling with the uh, community it is you, if you want to see the islamic architecture you would go to the narrow streets of cairo and you would go to the uh, inhabited uh, districts or neighborhoods so it is not in a, a separate uh, tourism area but it is within the city no actually they moved away uh, the efforts of Hassan, ha Hassan Fathi, the architect that I mentioned, uh, to my knowledge, are the only effort to revive the Islamic architecture. It happened in a specific period during the Ottoman period that was uh, there was a revival to the Mamluk architecture in particular. That's what uh, they called New Mamluk style, which appeared by the end of the Ottoman period. But in the modern times, they abandoned that type of architecture and they they prefer, of course, the modern architecture. Um, to my knowledge, as I mentioned, it was only the effort of Hassan Fathi who was trying to revive it again. Yes.
Yeah, uh, we, we actually have a problem in Islamic architecture in Egypt that most of the time the architect was anonymous person. We don't know him. He did not record his name. He did not mention uh, anything to uh, help us identify him. So most of the time he was anonymous. Unless we found, for example, in the Madrasa of Sultan Hassan, we found the name of the architect and the decorator in, uh, on the minaret of uh, uh, the Madrasa, of, uh, on the minaret of Al Mu'ayyad Sheikh we found also the name of the architect. But those were just a few examples of names that we managed to find. Other than this, they remained anonymous. Probably, yes. Probably they were considered as craftsmen, not like the elite of the uh, society, so they were not recognized. And um, even Sinan, in a, Sinan the Elder and Sinan the Younger, had their own architecture in Egypt, had, the, had their own fingerprints in Egypt. Maybe by the Ottoman period that they paid attention to uh, mention the name of the, archi uh, uh, the architect and to commemorate him in history and in uh, architecture too. Thank you so much. Uh, and there is a reception right now. Thank you. I can take the... the <laughs> Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.